I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning for the vaccine info session presented by the Healthcare Association of Forsyth County. The Healthcare Association of Forsyth County, or the HCA, was created in 2007 as one of the Chamber's initial target industry support groups. We identified that healthcare was not only one of the fastest growing communities, but one of the most vitally important to the future of our economy. Uh, while the HCA has been a resource to our local healthcare industry for many years, I think it goes without saying just how much of an incredible resource the healthcare industry has been to our community, certainly lately. Uh, it's an industry that we often take for granted, and we are so grateful to have incredible leaders, many of whom you're going to hear from today, uh, who have really supported our community through uh, it, one of its most challenging times. And so uh, we, we really just want to say again, thank you to, to all of um, uh, our healthcare providers. Uh, in just a minute, we're going to hear from, from them and their insights about this uh, difficult time that we are going through and uh, working through the, the, uh, the vaccine. Before we, we start with that, though, I want to uh, share some helpful tips uh, for you as, as folks who are uh, watching the, the, and participating in the um, webinar this morning. Uh, first, as you can imagine, we have received many pre-submitted questions during the registration process. In our panel discussion, we're going to work through uh, those questions first. Uh, if you do wish to submit a, a question during our panel discussion during the session, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen. Again, we will try to get through as many of, as question, many of those questions excuse me, as possible uh, during uh, our, our time today. I also want to remind everybody that after the event is over, you will be directed to take our post-event survey. Uh, this survey shouldn't take more than five minutes of your time to complete and allows you to share your insights that will help the Healthcare Association in turn provide better events for us as a community and, and for uh, providers as well. So now uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Zachary Taylor. Dr. Taylor serves as the State Director of District 2 Public Health, which includes 13 counties in Northeast Georgia. He has worked in public health for 35 years. He was an officer in the U.S. Public Health Service and worked in the Indian Health Service, CDC, and other federal postings for 30 years. For the past five years, Dr. Taylor served as the District Director in Dalton, Georgia, and in October was appointed District Director in Gainesville. Uh, Dr. Taylor, we are so grateful to you for taking time out of what I know must be an incredibly busy schedule, uh, and thank you for being with us and for the great work that you're doing. With that, Dr. Taylor, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Mr. McCoy, and uh, I'd like to thank the Chamber and the Healthcare Association for inviting me to be here. Uh, just a quick update on the status of uh, at least the public health uh, effort to vaccinate in uh, Forsyth County. As of yesterday, uh, we have uh, vaccinated 8,897, uh, we've administered 8,897 vaccines. Uh, we have a very unique partnership uh, in Forsyth County with the county, uh, with the Northside Hospital and between the public health department. And so the Forsyth County EMA has uh, set up some mass vaccination sites at uh, uh, two churches, Brownsbridge Church on uh, obviously Brownsbridge Road and the First Redeemer, uh, which I believe is in the southern part of the, the county. Uh, we have, uh, they have vaccinated of, of our 8,897 uh, doses, uh, they have vaccinated 5,625 persons or, or given that many vaccines, I should say more correctly. Uh, so that's a, a great partnership, and I'd like to thank Forsyth County and Northside Hospital for, for being part of that uh, partnership. A lot of people are asking, uh, how do I register for a vaccine? For public health, you can go to our, our website, which is phdistrict2.org. Uh, you can register online, or you can call our call center uh, at 1-888-426-5073 or 770-531-5692. Uh, also on our website, or you can go to the uh, statewide uh, Department of Public Health site, there's a, a link that allows you to find alternative sites because there are, other, there are alternatives that you can choose if you uh, are unable to schedule an appointment with us at this time. 
Uh, that includes uh, large pharmacy chains such as Kroger, Ingalls. Uh, it includes many times uh, large medical providers within the community uh, also. The, the problem we're all having, this is uh, not just here in Forsyth County, it's not just uh, here in Georgia, it's across the nation, is that uh, the demand for the vaccine exceeds our current supply of vaccine. Uh, so it may take you time to get an appointment. Uh, the lines may be uh, so overwhelmed that it's hard to get through on the phone. Uh, and there may not be any available appointments as we work through giving both first and second doses based on the supply of uh, vaccine that we have. But I would encourage you to keep trying. We will vaccinate everyone in all of the phases as we move forward, it's just going to take us time to do that. Currently, we're in what's called phase uh, 1A plus. And this phase includes uh, healthcare workers, uh, our first responders, so that's police, fire, EMS. Uh, it also includes persons who are over the age of 65 and uh, their caregivers. Uh, this phase, uh, It'll take us a while to work through this phase. We probably won't be completely through it until sometime uh, in mid to, to late March. Uh, and uh, then we'll move to the next phase. Now, the next phase hasn't been uh, exactly defined by the state, but uh, uh, I'm sure it will include our critical infrastructure uh, workers. That would include people such as our school staff, uh, it, could, it will include our uh, people involved in food production, uh, probably uh, critical utility type workers. Uh, and it probably will also include persons who are medically vulnerable, less than 65, but because of a medical condition that they have will make them much more susceptible to having severe COVID-19 disease, as well as hospitalization and even put them at risk of death. Um, again, I don't know uh, the timing exactly of uh, when we'll move into that next phase. It depends uh, probably on how quickly we can get through the phase we're in now and also the supply of the vaccine that's available to the state. The good news on the vaccine front is that uh, on uh, the 26th of this month, uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, uh, their candidate vaccine will be reviewed by the FDA. This is a different technology than the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that we're using now, and it does have some advantages. Uh, the biggest one is it's only one dose. So uh, that saves uh, us having to vaccinate people in a two-dose strategy, uh, and it also is uh, provides a, a little bit of ease to the uh, person being vaccinated as they don't have to return for that second dose. Another advantage is the storage. The, the current vaccines uh, require a freezer, and one of those, the Pfizer, requires what's called ultra cold storage, which is minus 70 degrees centigrade. Uh, this new Johnson & Johnson vaccine only requires refrigeration. So that's a huge advantage. Uh, it is effective. It was in the uh, trials that they did, it was 72% effective in the United States, uh, a little bit less in Latin America at 66% where they have some different uh, variant strains circulating and even a little bit less uh, effective in South Africa where there is a, a new variant there uh, that uh, is circulating and it was 57% effective there. However, you know, I think people look at that and they go, well, I don't want to take that one. I want to take the more effective Moderna or Pfizer. Uh, but I will point out that it's 85% uh, effective in preventing severe disease and that there were no deaths in the vaccine arm of the trial while there were five in the placebo arm. Johnson & Johnson has pledged to provide 100 million doses by the end of June. There, there are two other candidate vaccines that are in the pipeline. One is by AstraZeneca, 
and the other is by uh, Novavax. Uh, I don't yet know the dates that they will be ready to be reviewed by the FDA, but hopefully uh, sometime in uh, later spring we'll have those two vaccines available also. And this, all of this will help us with the, uh, uh, the supply of vaccine and allow us to vaccinate uh, many more people in a much faster manner than we're able to do at this point. And that's all I have right now, Mr. McCoy. Obviously, I'll be uh, pleased to answer any questions. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Taylor. We, we really, really appreciate it uh, in, in your leadership. And, and I know there's a, a, a number of questions uh, that are uh, going to be uh, posted out there and asked. And we thank you for sticking around with us uh, to, to keep the conversation going. So uh, with that, I uh, would like to take the uh, moment to uh, introduce uh, uh, Lynn Jackson, the Chief Operating Officer of Northside Hospital. I suspect that Lynn does not uh, need really an introduction to probably anybody who is, is watching or certainly on the call today. So, uh, but Lynn, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for your leadership and, and not just over the last year, but uh, for the last, um, I believe, close to 20 years, if not 20 years of your leadership at, at Northside and, and serving our community. Uh, that that past leadership has certainly uh, uh, made uh, for, for an incredible opportunity for us right now as a community to um, uh, uh, feel an incredible level of, of confidence in the great work that you have done and continue to done to do for us. And, and thank you so much. We, we uh, on behalf of a grateful community, thank you. Thank you so much, James. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here today. And this is such a unique and great opportunity for me to get to uh, host such a great panel today. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Taylor to join us as well as Dr. Callahan and Dr. Olson today in our panel. Uh, and uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for your very informative comments and thank you for your positive accolades for our community clinics that have been um, hosted these past couple of weeks. We could not have done that without the great support we got from the Department of Public Health and then the other community agencies that worked alongside of us. So that's been a, an incredible collaborative and we appreciate the support of the Department of Public Health. Um, I wanna uh, you know, say today, welcome to all of our panelists and to all everyone who's watching this today. Thank you for your interest in the vaccine. We're um, very hopeful about its future and us um, changing the path of this um, dreaded uh, COVID-19 disease. So um, I'm going to introduce someone who has definitely been um, on the front lines of this um, fighting this virus and helping our patients uh, throughout this time of pandemic. And he has um, certainly been a, a hero throughout this time. And I cannot uh, tell you enough about him, but I'm going to try to give you a little bit about Dr. Olson's background. Um, he finished his emergency medicine residency in 2002 at the Medical College of Georgia. Dr. Olson practiced in Augusta uh, at the Medical College until 2006, when we were fortunate enough that he then um, came to Northside and joined us here at Northside Forsyth. Uh, Dr. Olson currently serves in a variety of roles at Northside. Uh, we have him in as many roles as we can possibly get him in. Um, he's the medical director of the emergency department here at Northside Hospital for Scythe. He is the head of the sepsis tricampus uh, champion here. He's the director of ultrasound for the Northside Emergency Associates. And he also serves in his, I guess, spare time as the medical director for the Phoenix Air Group. Uh, a little bit about this group, they're responsible for contracts with the military and the U.S. State Department. They were responsible for all the Ebola evacuations into the European Union and the United States um, when Ebola was really rampant over uh, in Africa, particularly in some of those regions of the world. Uh, the Phoenix Air Group also repatriates Americans who work for the government with any medical emergency, including COVID-19. So Dr. Olson uh, literally flies all around the world in special transport to uh, help patients and, uh, you know, people who are very ill get back to their home country in many, many cases to get back to 
um, health care that they would need to recover. So we're so proud of Dr. Olson and uh, the work that he does, not only in our hospital, in our community, but around the world. So uh, thank you, Dr. Olson, for joining us today. In addition to thank our so panel much, today, thank you. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Dr. Olson? Well, I just wanted to uh, say many thanks for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and uh, I'm just lucky to be part of Northside. So, uh, thanks for that introduction. But I'm a I'm a I'm a lucky doc that works for the hospital. It works with a great administration. Well, thank you. I'll pay you later. Uh, now, on to uh, Dr. Callahan. Dr. Callahan is the president of North Point Pulmonary Associates, and he is originally from Warner Robins, Georgia. Um, he pursued his childhood dream of following in his father's footsteps to a career in medicine, and we are so glad that he did that. Uh, he's a graduate of Emory University with a bachelor's degree in biology. He attended the Medical College of Georgia and subsequently completed his residency at the internal, in internal medicine at the Carolinas Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. He specializes in pulmonary medicine and he has a board certification from the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. Um, he is a founding partner of the North Point Pulmonary Associates practicing uh, in this area, in the North Fulton uh, Forsyth area, and he practices here at Northside Hospital Forsyth we are so glad to have him as a member of our team. He has been here for many, many years and has been vital to our ongoing success and certainly our um, good care of our critical patients as well as so many of our pulmonary patients that you all can imagine have been severely affected by this COVID-19 virus. Um, he served as the chief of medicine for the North Fulton Hospital for years. He's also involved in community service as has Dr. Olson, uh, been involved in community service. Dr. Um, Callahan has been a founding member of the Good Samaritan Health Center in Atlanta, and he still is very active in both fundraising and in practice at the uh, Good Samaritan Health Center. So you can see by both of these doctors' um, resumes and how well qualified they are to be here and how lucky we are to have them not only as a part of our medical community, but also to have them as a part of our panel today. Dr. Callahan has specialized throughout this pandemic in caring for the acute patients with COVID-19, as well as now he is really focusing his attention on the patients in recovery from COVID-19 and patients uh, who are receiving the vaccine. So welcome, Dr. Callahan, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Lynn. It's just an honor to be here. And just like Doug, I am grateful that you chose to invite me. And I wanna say, uh, Next to marrying my wife, the second greatest decision I made was to join Northside Hospital. It's just a great community and a wonderful environment to work. And I want to say hats off to all of my staff members, all of my teammates, uh, the doctors who are working uh, tirelessly in our ICU and throughout our Northside Hospital to take care of these patients. We're doing wonderful work and they are true healthcare heroes. Thank you, Dr. Olson. You're exactly right. I consider all the, the team um, has done a great job and um, assisted in, in all of that through the public health sector, um, trying to uh, take care of patients in all settings. So today we're gonna focus on talking about the vaccine. And there's a lot of excitement about the vaccine and a lot of questions about it. Uh, obviously this is a, a first of its kind in, in our generation, so to speak, that something so globally has come to us so quickly and uh, we've been faced with so many decisions. And now um, hopefully everyone, as, as Dr. Taylor pointed out, there will be a chance for everyone to get the vaccine. So the question now will be, uh, you know, what, what will make everyone feel better to overcome maybe any vaccine hesitancy they have or anything they might have questions about. And so today's effort will be around trying to make sure that we're, they're getting information from a resource that would be able to provide them with great answers. Thank you to all of you out there in our, um, in our community who've sent us uh, questions. They were great questions. I was very impressed with uh, how wonderful people uh, wrote their questions and how thoughtful they were about um, what they wanted to know. So. If it's okay with everybody, we're gonna jump into our questions. Okay, so um, Dr. Taylor, the first one's gonna be for you. Um, 
it's my understanding uh, that the vaccine, uh, according to this question, forces your body to create the antibodies needed to resist COVID-19. If this is true and recovery from the <clears throat> virus also creates antibodies, how do people who've had the virus benefit from the vaccine? So that may be a little bit of a multiple question there. Uh, so that's a, that's a great question, uh, Lynn. So what the, the current vaccines do and what they all do is uh, they induce uh, through different mechanisms an immune response by the body. Uh, and what they also do in addition to that is it's, it's sort of a complete uh, immune response. So it, it involves both uh, what we call B cells and uh, the T memory cells. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, immune response. The, the memory cells, what they do is the B cells pr produce the antibodies that fight the virus uh, when it invades the body. What the memory cells do is that they remember uh, that this is a foreign particle and they're the ones that stimulate the B cells to produce the, the antibodies that fight the virus. Uh, natural infection uh, goes through a similar process, uh, but we believe that we're going to have a more robust uh, response with the, uh, the vaccine. So we do recommend, because we know that people who have been infected with COVID-19 can be reinfected, uh, we do recommend that those persons who have been uh, infected uh, that they do receive the vaccine. Now, they don't have to do it immediately after they recover from their infection. They probably have immunity <clears throat> for up to about 90 days. So I would, uh, uh, but they can be vaccinated any time after they recover from infection. Uh, that way, as we uh, increase our ability or what's called herd immunity, uh, then uh, what happens is the virus will uh, eventually uh, be controlled. It, the virus only does one thing, it just replicates. That's, that's all it does. Uh, and if it doesn't have a host that it can replicate in, uh, then it will go away. Dr. Taylor, on that same point, uh, another question was, is it possible that our DNA will be affected by the mRNA vaccine? No, the, the, the mRNA vaccine acts by uh, inducing the, the cell process to produce the protein that uh, causes the immune response. It does not enter the nucleus of the cell itself where our DNA is stored or kept. Uh, and once it's done its job, once it's produced this protein, it's eliminated from the from the cell itself. So it in no way can affect our own DNA. Very good. All right. Uh, the next question um, will be uh, Dr. Callahan. Um, Dr. Callahan, how long after having COVID um, should I wait before taking the vaccine? We're we're recommending that it would be a period of 90 days afterwards. There is some immunity that would obviously develop. As a matter of fact, some of our patients who have had COVID are now through Northside Hospital being uh, plasma donors. And uh, we have on, online, you can find out how to become a plasma donor if you previously had COVID. And we're using convalescent plasma in the hospital to treat people. So there is this period of time of immunity, but we are estimating that to be about 90 days. So mm -hmm. sometime within 90, at, at point of 90 days or beyond, we're recommending to go forward with the vaccine. Thank you. Um, Dr. Olson, how long does the vaccine protect a person for? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question, a difficult question to answer because we don't really know how long for sure, but what we do know is at least it's at least a year. So we just haven't been in this long enough to really get a get a good idea about how long the antibodies will be present. Uh, but from Moderna specifically, you know, they said that at least a year uh, and probably more. And when they have that protection, Dr. Olson, um, can you give a little bit more information about uh, whether or not the uh, person should be still using <clears throat> protective 
equipment? Should they still wear a mask? Should they still be careful around mm -hmm. others? Uh, what, what should they do after they've had the vaccine? Yeah, that's actually a really important question. And the answer is yes, we still need to be careful. So even though if you're vaccinated, you have immunity, or at least, uh, you know, depending on which vaccine you get a level of immunity and protection, uh, you still can be in, in quotes infected by the virus so that that virus can actually um, enter your body. So you have an internal mechanism to, you know, that's built up our immune system uh, from the, the vaccine itself that can actually attack that virus. So a lot of us would never even know that we actually have been, you know, exposed or infected in quotes. But I imagine, I kind of liken it like this. Um, imagine a, you know, a bank is being robbed and a, somebody is about to rob the bank and there's no advance notice. There's no, uh, you know, level of protection there beyond what's normally there. And so, you know, that person may have only one person to fight against as opposed to an advance notice. And you've already got the SWAT team there. They're ready for the you know, for this uh, this person to come and try to rob the bank. Well, imagine your immune system has that level of defense already and is prepared. And so that it can react uh, very quickly and neutralize that ant uh, the, uh, uh, the virus. Uh, so you may either get very minimal symptoms or no symptoms at all uh, with the infection. On the other hand, you would be infectious to somebody else and you may never know it. So it is important to maintain a level of protection for those around you. That, that's a great answer. And I, I uh, one of the questions was, can we transmit COVID-19 to others who have not been vaccinated without us knowing it? So it kind of, that is the, you kind of answered that, right, Dr. Olson? Yeah. So, you know, when you get the vaccine, you're not getting infected with the virus. I mean, this is not a live virus that you're getting infected with, but you are building up that immunity. So you can't technically just by getting the vaccine, give it to somebody, but you can be exposed and for you know a brief period of time, you could technically be infectious and not even know it. And that's why it's important to have our, our protection for others and our, wear our masks and wash our hands and so forth. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Taylor, um, is one vaccine better than the other? Well, I think there, there, there are choices people can make. Uh, I would say that the Moderna and the Pfizer are equivalent uh, to each other, at least as far as the, the effectiveness that they provide, which is over 90% for uh, both vaccines. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine appears to have less effectiveness in preventing uh, actual uh, COVID-19. However, it, it is very effective uh, at preventing uh, severe disease and probably equally effective at preventing hospitalization and death as the, the Pfizer and Moderna's. Uh, there's obviously, as people are deciding, they, they have to weigh things. So uh, is one dose more convenient for me? What, what vaccine is available at this point in time for me to get? <clears throat> so what choice should I make uh, uh, regarding vaccination based on those factors as well as the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine. Very good, thank you. Um, so, Dr. Olson, um, I know that you've kind of traveled all around or around the world and uh, you know, certainly people are looking forward to a time when they might be able to travel, but um, will the current vaccines be effective for the virus that's coming from Africa or maybe the UK, the variants? <clears throat> that's somewhat of a difficult question to answer for all the vaccines, actually. From the Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccine, yes, there is, a, there is protection, but from uh, Johnson Johnson and specifically the AstraZeneca, there is concern that uh, the level of protection is lower than they were suspicious of. In fact, there have been reports that they've decided not to continue uh, with AstraZeneca um, in South Africa for now until they get more data. But what we, they do think is that there is some level of protection and maybe against severe illness. Um, but Pfizer and Moderna do provide a level of protection uh, to the South African variant. And, and the one we're more concerned about right now is the UK uh, mutation. Um, and we do know that the protection is there, but you know the, they're still promoting the vaccination just because of 
the, the you know the typical strains that we're seeing that the vaccines are covering. Um, you know, viruses like to live, uh, so they like to mutate to maintain survival. And so we expect that to happen in the future as well. Uh, but our best defense right now is with the vaccine. Very good, thank you. Um, Dr. Callahan, um, how soon after getting the second shot um, would a person have high enough immunity to be around others, to be a little bit more free in their movements? That's a great question, Lynn. I think it depends, uh, like on the Pfizer vaccine, I believe it's a period of seven to 10 days. And uh, for the Moderna, it might be just a little bit longer, something like two weeks. So that, that time frame is a very short period of time um, to, be, to be back out you know, and be, have more comfort about it. But again, as Doug already emphasized, we're still recommending that people you know, wear masks, wash their hands, and, and, and space and, and practice that safe distancing. So, uh, but that is the general time frame. As far as the, um, the newer, Johnson and Johnson vaccine. I'm not exactly sure on the time frame. Maybe Dr. Zachary might know um, what the time frame might be uh, after you receive that vaccine. Do you know, Zach? Yeah, they're they're saying that it's probably four weeks after that first after that one dose uh, before you have full immunity. So, uh, as Dr. Callahan said, even after you've developed immunity, we we're asking you now to continue to do all the safe practices because of the risk, as Dr. Olson pointed out, that you can be infected asymptomatically and transmit to others. Very good, thank you. And along that same line, Dr. Callahan, um, someone asked, is it safe to visit elderly parents if you've been fully vaccinated and then maybe if both of you have been fully vaccinated, is that even better? Uh, you know, that's a that's a tricky question. Uh, elderly parents are certainly the highest risk. I mean, uh, of the patients that we've seen in Northside Hospital who, uh, who present the, the risk for death, it's certainly within our elderly population. So I think that's a personal choice that families would need to think about, pray about before they uh, move into. Certainly with the protection, uh, you feel safer. But as Doug even said, there's that potential possibility that you could be a carrier and, and, and no one would know that. And you could be asymptomatic as well. So that's a challenging question to answer. I, I, I wonder if you all other have, have any thoughts on it. If you, I would say that it could, uh, you, you have sort of different situations. The first one would be uh, you're vaccinated, fully vaccinated, but the elderly parents are not. And I would say that that presents a distinct risk to them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would be very, uh, I would be very careful. Uh, the second would be where your elderly parents are vaccinated fully and you're fully vaccinated. Uh, I'd feel much more comfortable with that situation. Uh, for both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third one would be where uh, the elderly parents are vaccinated, but you're not. Uh, and uh, I would say that in that situation, there's a risk to you uh, if, from the, if they're asymptomatically infected. And I would be uh, tend to be more uh, comfortable with that as long as people sort of socially distanced and uh, warm more masks if possible. I, you know, the fact is, is that once our, I mean, I have grandchildren, uh, you know, uh, the, the thing I think grandparents miss the most is hugging their grandchildren. I think once they're fully vaccinated, they're gonna hug their grandchildren regardless <laughs> of what we say here today. <laughs> yeah. And I'll weigh in on that as well. I, I actually, one of the benefits of the vaccine, you know, one of the things that we consider as far as your, in, in, if you want to describe as infectivity is the what we call the viral load so that's one of the benefits of the vaccine as well so if it even if you are infected with it the idea is that your your immune res, uh, response is quick to to react and so the amount of of viral load or amount of virus within your body is less than somebody who may not have been you know vaccinated so the chance the chance is less of getting somebody else infected as well because of the viral load is less. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, Dr. Taylor, 
Uh, could you maybe talk a little bit about the risks of taking the vaccine? Well, um, all medications, all vaccines, have some risks. The, the risk here is small. Uh, I, I will sort of differentiate two things. If one is reaction and one is uh, a reaction to the vaccine and one is the, an adverse effect. So we expect people to have reactions to both the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccine. And typically those reactions are, uh, they may have a mild fever. They certainly will probably have some soft arm soreness uh, and uh, they may have what feels like the flu as far as delays and uh, being really tired and having that achiness. This is more likely after the second dose than it is after the first dose, but it could happen with both doses. And we've seen in people who've been previously infected with COVID-19 that they tend to have this reaction after the first dose as opposed to the, uh, the second dose. So that's, that's expected, it's normal, it's simply the body uh, developing its immune response to the, to the virus. Um, however, there are some uh, other reactions which can happen uh, with, the, with both vaccines. Uh, certainly uh, there are people who have what's called a severe anaphylactic reaction. That's a uh, um, reaction where they may have uh, tingling, they may have a, a rash on their body, and they may have trouble breathing. We're prepared to deal with that pop, with, the, with that problem at our vaccination sites. Um, the, it's more likely in persons who've uh, had severe allergic reactions to other vaccines or to other medications. Uh, and if you have that type of reaction to the, to the vaccine, then there's a contraindication you should not receive uh, a second dose if you have that with the first dose. Uh, so we're prepared for that. In the trials, uh, in the, uh, the Pfizer trial, there were uh, uh, people who uh, had what's called Bell, Bell's palsy. It's sort of a partial paralysis of one side of your face. Um, that happened in, uh, in, in persons who were in the vaccine arm. Uh, there were no other real severe reactions other than the allergic reactions we've noticed in, in that. Uh, however, you know, very rare types of reactions uh, may not appear until millions of people have been vaccinated. So it's quite possible that we'll see some very rare types of uh, adverse events in the future. But uh, to my knowledge, we haven't seen any yet. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And Dr. Olson, what about have what have you seen anything in the emergency department, uh, sort of secondary to what we're seeing at the maybe the clinic level? Just mild, uh, mild reactions mostly. I mean, just personal. You know, I just kind of felt a little achy, maybe a low grade fever, but nothing, nothing of any significance. Uh, we've had some reports of some allergic reactions, uh, but that's. I mean, that could happen with food or any other medication for that many, matter, anything we put into our body. So we expected that, but we've not had any severe uh, adverse side effects from the, from the vaccine. Very good. Um, well, since we're talking about that, uh, Dr. Callahan, um, if, if, is the vaccine recommended if a person has an allergy to eggs and cannot or has not ever received uh, any regular vaccines or any flu shots? Uh, what's What's the indication for them? Yeah, the whole uh, issue of, about eggs, uh, it doesn't have any relevance in this situation. Uh, so we are recommending that people move forward. Um, and uh, if they have had severe allergies, so in their past, they should, you know, consult with their doctors. But, uh, but even still, you know, I think um, the priority is to get the vaccine. Um, and I think uh, it's safe. And we've found that um, it's effective as we've talked about. And so um, that's what we're recommending. Very good, okay. Um, Dr. Taylor, um, when, it, when it happens that they have first dose and then there is a second dose involved. Uh, so for the two dose um, vaccines, what about any 
Um, you know, is there anything they need to do? Uh, you know, we've read some about preventive medicines before they go to the vaccine uh, shot time or any post-shot uh, meds that they should take or recommend it, or is it uh, just personal preference? What, what recommendations are there for that? In, in general, I would recommend that they don't take anything prior to the shot. Uh, uh, we particularly don't want them to take uh, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs or uh, prednisone or something like that, which might affect the ability of the body to develop an immune response. Um, you know, if after they receive the shot, if they if they have if they okay. They're unable to tolerate the, 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 the fever or the, uh, the aches and pains, then they could take Tylenol uh, in response to that. I, I think it's important to note too uh, that people should, uh, we, we don't give the vaccine if they receive another vaccination within 14 days prior to the vaccine. Uh, so, and they shouldn't receive another vaccine until. 14 days after they're vaccinated. So in general, I'd recommend that in between doses, they don't receive another vaccine uh, unless there's some compelling reason to do so. Uh, and uh, certainly if they've uh, received convalescent uh, plasma or the monoclonal antibody treatment, we think they should wait at least 90 days after receiving that uh, that therapy before they're vaccinated, because simply because that could interfere with their ability to develop an immune response to the vaccine. Right. Um, Dr. Olson, uh, Dr. Taylor mentioned the monoclonal antibodies. And um, could you just give a little word about maybe what is, um, what's the difference around monoclonal antibodies versus the vaccine? Well, the monoclonal antibodies are, you know, synthesized, if you will, they're, they're, you know, in the hospital, we give convalescent plasma, and I'll kind of touch base on that as well, because convalescent plasma is plasma from uh, people who have recovered from COVID-19. And so we're giving them antibodies, if you will, from the convalescent plasma uh, to help fight off um, the infection. Well, monoclonal antibodies are kind of a sim similar concept, but uh, they are essentially synthesized. So it's not a obtained from a host, if you will, similar to convalescent plasma. So uh, these have, uh, you know, shown some uh, high benefit to people. Um, we've seen up to 78% reduction in severity of illness and hospitalizations, and uh, we're hoping, uh, you know, that this will also prevent death. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, becoming more on the forefront uh, for treatment. Very good. Um, Dr. Callahan, um, one of the questions that's come in is after vaccinated, would it show up on a test that I have antibodies? That's a good question. Um, just back to what Doug was saying about the monoclonal antibodies. We have had experience through Northside uh, giving this as an outpatient to our patients. And uh, we've had an outstanding response through that. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, yes, I think th there should be evidence for that. Um, it, it, the antibodies would show up um, um, over time after, you know, we talked about the time period for Pfizer, Moderna, and then the Johnson & Johnson being a, a little bit of a different time frame. Um, and as Doug mentioned earlier, we don't know the, how long, um, but at least a year, hopefully, that would be uh, protective. Mm -hmm. And one thing to mention about the monoclonal antibodies as well is it is still under emergency use authorization. So not every not everybody that gets COVID-19 is actually a, you know, a potential re, uh, a recipient of this. It has to meet criteria. And that can actually be found on, you know, on the website, on the CDC website as well. But um, uh, you know, we're hopeful with it. Uh, and I think it's going to show a lot of benefit anecdotally as well, you know, like Dr. Callahan said that. We've seen some great benefit from it so far. Uh, patients that are admitted to the hospital actually do not meet criteria for treatment with the monoclonal antibody. And that's an important thing to mention is, as of right now, there's no data to show proven benefit uh, with that uh, for hospitalized patients. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Taylor, 
Um, are there any COVID-19 vaccinations available or have been tested on school-aged children? I, I believe that they have trials uh, beginning on that age, but the youngest they've gone down to with the, the trials so far has been the age of 16. Okay. So the, the Pfizer was actually um, approved for 16 and older, though we're only using it in 18 and older at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, let me add something. I think it's important for people to know that, that, that this pandemic, this tragedy that we've been going through um, has sparked medical innovation. We've never had a, a, a messenger RNA vaccine before. And uh, now we do. And this can potentially be a game changer as far as our, our vaccinations go. Uh, and hopefully we'll benefit from that in the future. And uh, also the, the monoclonal antibody therapy, uh, you know, the, the, our improvements in how we treat people. It's, it's really been a remarkable response by our, our scientists, our physicians, our nurses, our hospitals and how we care for people. So uh, although it, it is definitely a tragedy, it has been a tragedy, uh, when we come through this, I think we'll be more resilient and stronger in our ability to respond to future threats uh, that may, may happen in the future. That is such a great point, uh, Dr. Taylor. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, Dr. Callahan, about how many years are we anticipating at this point? Might we need to continue to receive maybe, is it considered like a booster shot? Uh, of the vaccine, kind of similar to maybe what they had for other vaccines that might need a booster? Are they anticipating potentially that this would be a booster? You know, I think we're all learning as we go, Lynn. And uh, I think uh, that's something that we'll, we'll have to determine as time goes by. But most likely, yes. If you think about um, other uh, coronaviruses that we've had, influenza viruses, uh, they tend to mutate or change from year to year. And uh, so it's potentially a possibility that down the line, we're, we're gonna have to have boosters. Um, I'm curious to hear, Zach, what you have to say about that because uh, that, that's sort of the, what, where we see in, 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 with Pneumovax and you know, there are different strains of that that we have to give the, the 13 and the 23, 23 uh, vaccination. And so there is this change that viruses tend to do over time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a very primitive virus. Uh, it is essentially a, a protein envelope that has some genetic material in it. Uh, and uh, it only does one thing, it replicates. And it, uh, if it can find a better way to replicate through natural selection, of course the virus isn't deliberately doing that, it's simply natural selection then it will do so. And that's why we have these new variants that are popping up over the world. But we gotta remember that we live in a global society. Uh, you know, if we were totally successful in controlling uh, COVID-19 here in the, the United States, that doesn't mean that they'll be totally successful in other parts of the world. And so it's quite possible that uh, the, the virus will mutate such that our current strategy of vaccination is no longer effective and we'll have to adapt to that. The, the, the dream is, is that we can, uh, through some of this new technology, that we can produce a, a, a universal vaccine that will cover all coronaviruses because again, we could have another coronavirus uh, arise in the wild since it does occur in animals and it could cause another pandemic. So uh, I think as we move forward, we're not going to be caught as flat-footed as we were with this current pandemic. Uh, and hopefully we'll be at a point where with these universal vaccines, no one will get any type of coronavirus. Uh, and perhaps the technology will lead to a universal influenza vaccine. We won't have to get yearly influenza vaccines. But I think Dr. Callahan's right. Uh, our immune system tends to wane over time. It tends to forget uh, what is a foreign invader. So boosters are, are definitely probably something that we will need to do in the future. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. Thank you. That's so interesting. Um, uh, Dr. Olson, do you think that um, if, if a person's already had COVID uh, and maybe, uh, you know, this issue of having two vaccines, you know, the, the two doses, um, should people continue to plan to get two doses if it's a two dose um, vaccine? Um, or if they've had COVID before, is it enough that they just get one? Yeah, I, it's a good question. Absolutely, they should get the second vaccine, whatever is recommended by, um, you know, by the CDC or the FDA or the pharmaceutical company for that matter. So after the, for example, after the first dose of uh, Pfizer, you have about 50%, it's thought to about 50% immunity approximately. And then after the second booster shot, you know, at that point uh, up to 95%. Um, and so, uh, it is very important to get that second one, even if you've had COVID-19 before. The question is, and like Dr. Taylor mentioned, you know, how long are you actually immune after having COVID-19? And we know we don't see reinfections regularly, for sure. I, to be honest with you, they probably happen more than we realize. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we do know that the neutralizing antibodies uh, decrease over time. And so there have been some reports, do we have the question is, do we have immunity for up to eight months? Or is it one month? Or is it three months? And so this is a very difficult answer. And, you know, when I, I get asked this by staff, actually, uh, quite regularly, and I tell them, I said, how are you going to know when you are not immune anymore after you've had COVID-19? And the only way to really have an idea is to regularly test for neutralizing antibodies. And so that's not an easy thing to do. Um, and quite frankly, it just makes much more sense to go and get vaccinated when it's your time after an infection to get vaccinated and develop a longer term immunity. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Callahan, I know that probably in your practice, you uh, see patients who are immunocompromised. So if a person does not meet the criteria of the current 1A plus standard, you know, being 65 or older or in one of the professions that's covered, what would be your advice to them if they are immunocompromised to protect themselves until such time as they are eligible for vaccine? Well, by immunocompromised, you mean patients that are like HIV or maybe they have cancer, maybe they're receiving chemotherapy, their rheumatoid arthritis. Um, uh, yes, we have a high priority to get them vaccinated as soon as possible. And um, there are ways to go about doing that through either their their primary doctors or um, their their uh, through even through our hospital uh, we we have that opportunity for patients to who are immunocompromised. Um, I know the cancer doctors uh, are doing that, uh, offering that to their patients, and they are considered to be immunocompromised. So um, there are ways to go about uh, doing this. Even healthcare providers, mm -hmm. if you're a provider for your family member, um, you, you should be given that opportunity as well, so. Very good. I think one important thing to mention about the immune compromise as well is, is their, their level of infectivity. So patients that have cancer or undergoing chemotherapy are considered possibly infectious longer than the normal population. The other, the other question is, is how long they would actually take to develop antibodies compared to somebody else and that this is where uh, through a, through a natural infection so this is where the the vaccine becomes very important um dr taylor um i know you've spoken about how uh you know people can get access to the you know getting signed up for the vaccine as it becomes available and certainly um we were appreciative of that information that you released we'll certainly make that a part of our ongoing um, information that we uh, have available after this seminar in this uh, this forum today. But um, one question that came in is insurance required to get the COVID-19 vaccine? And if so, what kind is accepted? So uh, when we vaccinate someone, we ask them if they have insurance or Medicare and, and we do bill their insurance, what's called an administration fee. That's to help us recover the cost of uh, doing these operations. There is no charge to the patient, and this does not affect their copay in any way. Uh, if they don't have insurance, uh, then they get the vaccine for free. Uh, 
no one should be charging for the vaccine itself because that's provided free of charge to everyone. Uh, all the providers, the pharmacies, everyone who's providing the vaccine, that's being paid for by the federal government. Um, so, uh, and again, if you don't have any type of insurance, you will be vaccinated and you will not be charged anything at all. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to time. Unfortunately, we've got so many great questions and so much uh, good to share here. I, I just wanted to ask one thing that had come up in the to chat that I think is important is once vaccinated, uh, maybe Dr. Olson, you could answer this, once vaccinated and then exposed to COVID, do I need to quarantine? Well, actually, uh, I believe the CDC actually just put out, uh, or actually maybe it was Dr. Fauci put out that uh, there's no requirement for COVID-19 uh, exposure to be um, uh, quarantined at that point. So based on what I've seen just most recently, and actually maybe Dr. Taylor would know this better than me, but uh, my understanding is, is there's no requirement for quarantine if you've been back, if fully vaccinated, mind you. So you've gone through your your series of shots and then you know, you've given yourself uh, anywhere from a week to two weeks, depending on which vaccine you got. Um, and, and at that point, if you've had an exposure, uh, there's no requirement for qu quarantine. Uh, Dr. Taylor, am I correct on that? Yeah, I, I was just looking at my emails trying to find the, the notice. I, I quickly scanned through it. I believe that they are changing. Up till now, we've been requiring people who've been vaccinated and exposed to quarantine, but uh, I, I believe that now they're treating it like a, uh, an infection, a person who's been infected who we don't require to be quarantined uh, for up to 90 days. And so uh, I think that uh, that'll be much more relaxed. I know that uh, as we move forward and we, we vaccinate our critical infrastructure, our teachers and uh, food uh, providers and those types of industries that this will be a great relief to them to not have to quarantine mm -hmm. their staff if, if they've been vaccinated and probably yeah, an inducement for them to be vaccinated mm -hmm. yeah i think i think updated guidelines for that are about to come out um you know and just from from what i've read in the last 24 hours well uh, we're coming so close to time, and this has been uh, such a wonderful forum. I have certainly learned a lot, and I thought I knew a lot about the vaccine, but uh, I've learned so much, and I am so appreciative of each one of the uh, panel members, Dr. Callahan, Dr. Olson, Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much for not only sharing your expertise and your time, but for all the great care you're taking of our patients and our community and uh, providing this great community service in, in addition. We've had a lot of other great questions coming in and maybe we can figure out a way to uh, maybe keep people engaged on that and maybe do, you know, a host other series or keep this uh, conversation going at some point in the future. Uh, we're very excited by it, but uh, with time coming to an end today, I'm going to turn this back over to James McCoy and thank you so much, James, for allowing, uh, you know, the Healthcare Association to have a, a vital part of uh, this presentation today. Lynn, thank you so much, and 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 for um, uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, Dr. Callahan, Dr. Olson, thank all of you uh, for your time today. We are honored uh, that you would take time out of your schedules to to uh, share this information. Uh, I've been getting messages on on my phone and and social media as we've been going along uh, uh, with some great feedback, and and uh, so so thank you again. And yes, Lynn, I I hope we certainly can. Um, uh, keep the conversation going uh, either through uh, additional uh, series of, of these sort of meetings um, and also uh, online, uh, uh, both through social media and, and uh, website interaction. Uh, as a reminder to everybody, we will be, for everybody who's registered, uh, we will be sending a follow-up email to remind uh, or to, to let you all know uh, about future uh, uh, 
uh, uh, discussions like this, but also it will also include all of the links that were mentioned in today's call uh, and some additional information uh, that was brought up in, in today's discussion. Uh, and we'll, of course, be reposting uh, the, the a recording of this uh, a bit later. So uh, I do want to also thank um, uh, Mr. Todd Shiflett uh, with uh, Georgia Highlands Medical Services. He has been a great partner to the uh, both Healthcare Association and, and our chamber and uh, was instrumental in helping us uh, uh, put this call together as well. And I and, uh, just want to say a, a special thanks to, to Todd. So with that, thank you all very much for your time today. Uh, and we, we appreciate it more than I can tell you. And um, we will be back in touch with all of you who are, are registered. Thank you again.